This might be the biggest day, the biggest week in crypto. It happened. It happened, everybody. Let's go. Let's go. The ETH ETF has been approved in the U.S. The political backdrop has completely changed. We started this year. We didn't know what was going to happen. Gary Gensler was on a crusade against us. Biden was going anti-crypto with his administration. And now it seems that it's completely 180 in one week. What is going on? What does it mean for the markets? What does it mean for your bag? We're going to tell you today. Well, this is just going to be a wild episode, Jay. Look, we're going to mainly talk about ETH, obviously. We're going to talk about what's going on in the political world as well, because there's tons there. We're going to be cheersing. I don't know about you, Jay. I'm having a beer. I just opened up. You can see on the screen, I've got a nice fresh cold Imperial as I'm in Costa Rica. So that's the, the local beer. What do you have, Jay? I got an espresso. What is that? <laughs> got an espresso. <laughs> Jay's got an espresso. We actually held off on recording. We usually record in the morning. It is now, I don't know, Just we just got the approval. We wanted to wait and make sure that this happened before we recorded so we could get you the most up-to-date information as you listen Friday morning to hear what's going on. Uh, we're also going to talk about some craziness going on in the Pumped Up Fun world with the hacker. We're going to talk a little bit about Jupiter and them trying to bring everything on chain. CryptoPunk's biggest fail. A bunch of stuff that you probably missed this week because honestly, everything that we were paying attention to all week was the ETH ETF. But before we jump in, a quick announcement. Next week, May 29th, we are having an AMA, and I'll bet you you're going to have a lot of questions coming out of this week and heading into this weekend because things are going to be happening. So we got an AMA. This AMA is only for pro members. It's happening in our Discord. So if you're not a pro member, click the link in our show notes and go pro before next week, May 29th, 12 p.m. Eastern in the Discord. You can bring your questions. Kyle, myself, and the whole Milk Road team will all be there to answer all your questions and make sure that you feel good with your bags, with your investments, and you're ready to crush it in the coming months because, yeah, there's some opportunities to make some money. That is for sure. sure. Inside the, the Discord is a form that you can fill out and get your questions asked now, and that way we'll get them into the session next week, and we will be sure to answer as many as we possibly can. So if you're not yet pro, go pro. We also were telling you to get some ETH. Uh, I think we put out a whole pro report on ETH last month and said mm -hmm. we still believe that the ETF was going to get approved even when everyone else said it wasn't. And we were damn right. <laughs> feels so good. We didn't actually say for so sure. Good. We just said it was odds, which by the way, we'll talk about that too. We'll All talk right, about Jay, let's get this started. Okay, let's jump in. First up, we're going to skip BTC price chart. Usually we start with BTC, but we're going to skip. We're going to go straight to ETH. Kai, what is going on with ETH this past week? Well, if you look at this chart right now, the last like I got the daily hours, chart on. This is the daily chart that's up here. Yeah, right. right. The last couple hours have been absolutely wild. Obviously, the news broke on Monday. And so that's when ETH just jumped from. It was about 3,000. It's currently sitting at almost 3,800. It was a wild move in on Monday. And then we sort of stayed flat as everyone wasn't really sure what was going to happen. And then now with the approval today, it was supposed to get approved at like 4 p.m. EST. And it right at 4, it didn't get approved and everyone started selling. And so we went down to like 3,500 and then people weren't really sure. And now it's approved and we're sitting at, you know, close to 3,800. So people like to buy and sell real fast. No one has, seems to have conviction. But either way, all is good because the spot Ethereum ETF was just approved by the SEC literally a few minutes ago as we have clicked mm. record here jay you want to break down the beginning of this yeah we've done it this is super exciting so let me pull up here the official announcement from the sec where it basically breaks down that they have under rule 19b4 which allows them to allow exchanges stock exchanges within the u.s to offer these commodity products to retailers they're saying this is official it has been approved and it is go time baby we are on it's time to happen uh, i'm just trying to look here kai on who got approved we've got yeah it's Grayscale. basically all of them yeah grayscale bitwise iShare. so it's all the ones that have been applying and, and refile and refiling so we don't know the i don't know the numbers yet but it's five six seven of them basically everyone is getting approved and they're doing it all at the same time now Reminder, these are not live today. We mm. still don't know what that is. It could take days to weeks. The best guess, there was just a report that was put out saying probably in July is when these start. 
we'll see. It could be faster, but we don't really know at this point. All we know is everyone's getting approved. It's all happening probably at the same time. They are put under the commodity rules, not the securities, which is huge. We talked about that in our episode earlier this week, and all of them have no staking. So there will not be any staking for any of these, but that's all good. We just wanted to get these things live. The staking will come in the future. For now, we just needed to get these things approved. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how long this is going to take. I know you said July. Here I've got James Safehart saying that he thinks it could be a couple of weeks, but it could take longer. But we will know more within the next week. So definitely next week, keep an eye on the newsletter and on our podcast because we'll be keeping you guys up to speed on when we can expect the actual ETFs to start be traded by these institutions. And we're going to talk about in a second what that means for inflows and what we predict will happen. But first, Kai, let's just take a step back and talk about odds for a second here because there seemed to be some confusion this week. So we started this week. Before this week, we are sitting at about 25% odds of the Ethereum ETF being approved. Clearly, it's now been approved. Then on Monday, there was a big switch as a lot of people started to speculate that it was going to get approved this week and it moved to 75% odds of being approved. And so a lot of people were confused because when it was at 25%, people were saying, well, why you were wrong, it's going to get approved. And then when it moved to 75%, people were saying, well, it should be 100% because it's clearly going to happen now. What's the yeah, confusion so here? This is the Bloomberg boys, Eric Balkunas and, and Jeff who they put out these predictions. And by the way, they have been extremely helpful guiding everyone in the crypto world who had no idea about what an ETF is or how this process works previous to Bitcoin. So they've been absolutely amazing. And they got just ripped on Monday because they were once at 25% and they moved it to 75%. Everyone's like, oh, you can't just change the goalposts. And that's how odds work. That's the whole point, right? From the data they had at that moment, it was 25%. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Everyone's like, well, now it's happened. So you guys are wrong. They said there was 25% chance it was happening. So that, that means that they were right. They just said it wasn't a good chance, which was also very much right. It was not looking good until Monday. And then just because we got word that, hey, they wanted them to refile, that doesn't mean it's going to get approved either. It's Nothing's 100%. And so they went to 75. And this is just how odds work. I'm surprised how many people are just kind of missing this and not understanding that if you say it's 25% chance of happening and it happens, you're still right. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just don't get how people can't quite understand that. So anyway, thanks to Eric. Thanks to Jeff. You guys have been just incredible to guide us through this. And to be fair, this was a wild turn of events. I'm not sure that people are really understanding how big of a deal this is. Like, this was a basically a for sure zero. They, they even said they actually wanted to put it to 10%, but they didn't. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. this was not what Gary Gensler wanted. This was not going to get approved. And then something happened over the weekend of last or on Monday that just changed the tune. And we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in the political world in just a second. Mm -hmm. But um, we believe that it, this was the, I don't want to say the president exactly, but this is something to do with the political movement um, mm -hmm. that has changed the course of the SEC's decision here. Okay, before we move in on to the political situation, because there's a lot to talk about there and what happened this week that led to this, but there's some other news as well out of the US House. But first, Kai, what do you think we can expect to see in terms of inflows? That's going to be the big question that I think everybody's going to be asking over the next week is when this does go live, how much of this ETF is going to be bought in comparison to Bitcoin, which obviously has been massive over big $13 success, yeah. billion dollars in net inflows so far, $20 billion in gross inflows to date. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's anyone's guess at this point. It's really tough to say. Eric Balkunas has a tweet up here where he says maybe it gets about 10 to 15% of the flows of Bitcoin, which seems pretty good. I said on the show earlier this week, maybe around 30% due to just looking at the comparison between ETH E and GBTC, the Grayscale Trust that, that were live well before the ETFs. My ballpark is probably somewhere between 10 and 30%. It's just really tough to say because I just don't know how much institutions really understand what ETH is just yet. It also kind of, matters about what's the backdrop here in terms of macro. If rates start coming down by July and that's when we turn this thing on, or or maybe we turn this thing on by mm -hmm. August is when the, all mm -hmm. of a sudden we can trade and rates are down and inflation's down. It's not an issue. Like we could blow these numbers out of the water from what Bitcoin did because Bitcoin did this not in the greatest macro environment, right? And so like, it really depends a little bit on, okay, what do the institutions already know about Ethereum? And I think many of them are still trying to wrap their heads around it. They're, they're actually really just trying to wrap their heads around Bitcoin at the moment. So there's the education side of it. 
And then there's like, what's happening in markets in general? We've obviously been in a lull for the last few months. This has really moved things up a, a notch over the last week or so. But now it's back to macro. What, what's going on with macro? And if we're in a risk on environment, ETH is going to do really well. And I think ETFs will do well. The only other point I would say is in terms of do institutions really understand ETH? Some, it gets more complex. So there is a lot to understand, but it's also a little bit more simple because they have revenues and they have you know fees and expenses. If you understand that side of how blockchains work, smart contract platforms, that is, it's kind of a kind to like a, an app store or a Google Play store. So like mm -hmm. they have ways of valuing this where you didn't really have that with Bitcoin as a store of value. And so I don't, it's hard to say, are they going to know it or not? I've heard a lot of people say when they talk to institutions about crypto, they kind of get uh, Ethereum right off the bat because it just sort of makes sense. Whereas Bitcoin is this different asset, something that we've never really had before. So anyway, we'll see kind of what happens there. It also depends, like, will a bunch of people want to hold ETF or will they just go straight on chain so they can get the yield? Mm -hmm. That's the thing mm -hmm. that I don't really know. Either way, this is massively bullish for Ethereum, for the whole crypto space. And um, it really just legitimizes this. And I think it makes it more acceptable for brands and companies, institutions to start, you know, coming in and buying ETH, sure, but also using ETH and building on ETH. And I think that's going to be the biggest driver of this ETF more than anything. It feels silly to go to the Bitcoin chart, but let's just take a look at Bitcoin over the last week. What's going on here? Yeah, Bitcoin sitting at 67,000, up 2.23% on the week, which is kind of funny. I mean, it was down pretty bad, though. We were having a rough start to the week. And then obviously with the news, it jumped up to over 71,000. And now it's currently sitting at 67,000. So ETH is still dominating or is dominating this week so far. Solana had had a wild week as well. It obviously jumped on the news originally. And then it sort of pulled back, gone back down to about $168 today. And it's pumped on the ETH ETF news as well. Currently sitting at about 178 and up 11.67% of the week. So still doing pretty good. Although ETH has, has obviously blown those two out for this week. So I think ETH has its moment for a little bit here as it's been the one lagging, right? Everyone's been talking about Bitcoin and Solana. Not much has been said about Ethereum. And, and now Ethereum is going to be in the spotlight for the next little bit here leading up to whenever this thing goes live. The other chart I've got up here is the total crypto market cap, which uh, if you look at this over the past week, up almost 7% on the week. Now, obviously, most of this was driven by ETH, which brought uh, over $100 billion, uh, in market cap in when it jumped up its 20% earlier this week. But that's not all. Everything, all, all boats are rising with this tide right now. Yeah, I mean, Ethereum was sitting at around 2.2-ish 2. It was 2 .2 -ish or 2.25 trillion, or sorry, the total crypto market cap was sitting on there at the beginning of the week. And then with the news, obviously, it jumped to close to 2.6. It's now sitting at 2.47 trillion. So it's gone up a few hundred billion since Monday, which is huge. ETH brought about 100 of that. But of course, ETH ecosystem tokens have just been lights mm. out over the week as well. I haven't opened up my CoinGecko to see what they're doing right now. But Jay's got a list up here. This is from, I don't know if this is live or what, but Pepe up 46% on the week. Lido up 30%. Uniswap 26%. Athena 28%. You know, there's just, everything is going off. Liquid Everything's staking going tokens off. are going nuts. Yeah. So it's been a, it's a wild one. I mean, this is because obviously if ETH is doing well, then its ecosystem tokens are going to do well. But more importantly, you got to look for a lot of these protocols earn revenue in ETH. And so just by ETH going up 20% in a day, their revenue just went up 20%, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not like they got more users, more activity from that, although they will, because the more ETH goes up in price, the more people will transact and do things on chain. Uh, and so some of these tokens or some of these protocols, let's say, when ETH goes up in price, their revenue goes up more than that. So if ETH goes up 20%, their revenue goes up 20% just from ETH, but then also from more activity, more users coming on that chain. So they can be thought of as beta plays. You got to spot those ones out, but there's a bunch of them that do that right now. Plus their treasuries. A lot of these people, uh, a lot of these mm -hmm. protocols hold ETH in their treasuries. And if ETH rockets, their treasuries go up, which means everyone in the space just has more money to do other things. And a lot of times people will go down the risk curve and invest elsewhere. So let, the, it works. Good, let the good times roll. Okay, let's go over to uh, a lot of political news that happened this week. So first up, the week started off with the FDIC chair, Martin Grunberg, resigning. Now, Martin was the one that was behind Operation Choke Point 2.0, which was aimed at really targeting the crypto and digital asset industry and affecting the space as a whole from the political side. So him resigning and stepping down was sort of the first domino to fall this week. 
Well, that then, happened on the same day. That happened on the same day as all of a sudden we had the speculation around the Ethereum ETF approval mm-hmm. going through. So it was like two things came on Monday. And we're like, okay, this is a weird start to the week. Like, what's going on here? And then we had, and then we had the SEC has been trying to pass SAB 121, which is their law that will enable will not enable banks to custody crypto and what happened was last week we talked about this and biden said that he would veto this if it passed through well it did pass through both the house and the senate and biden has not vetoed it yet we've all been watching and waiting to see would biden veto this hasn't vetoed it he does have until may 28th to make his decision on this. And it seems likely that the political, really that the Democrats have pulled a big political shift here and switched from being anti-crypto to pro-crypto. So all positive signs for everybody. And this is a pretty big deal. I mean, we talked about that. We'll see what Biden decides to do, but we talked about this one last week where this is what allows banks to custody crypto assets. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna make the UX of using crypto, not using crypto, but holding crypto, much easier for boomers, institutions, et cetera. Obviously, the, the ETFs uh, help with that a lot. But so does just allowing where all of the money already is, which is in banks, at least in the US and in Canada, et cetera. You know, if we can just use that rate right in the banks themselves, then it's going to be much better. And so that's what we're trying to do here. Biden wasn't going to allow that. It seems like he's going to now. So that's a pretty big deal. But there's one more big deal that's happening too in the regulation side of things. Probably the biggest deal of all is that the House has approved Crypto Fit 21. This bill has passed with a wave of Democratic support. Look, the biggest thing here is this was a really a bipartisan movement that happened seemingly out of nowhere when everyone thought that the Dems were going to go against this bill. A lot of them crossed party lines in order to support this bill. and. This bill itself, the objective of this bill is to establish a team that will regulate the U.S. crypto markets. You did hear that correctly. We've all been asking for clarity for so long, and they are finally going to give us clarity. It also defines responsibilities between the SEC and the CFTC, and it makes the CFTC the new leading regulator of digital assets. So under this bill... The CFTC would have primary oversight, whereas up until now, the the SEC and the CFTC have basically been fighting to try to say, hey, these are, it's my job to regulate this. No, it's my job to regulate this. Now, what this means when you really get down to the brass tacks is that BTC, ETH, Sol, Likely Sol, and most layer ones, most blockchain networked assets are now going to be labeled as commodities and they will fall under the CFTC. Doesn't mean the SEC loses all jurisdiction. They will have some jurisdiction, but it'll be limited tokens that basically give financial interests such as equities or debt or dividends through their business entity. So a lot of the application tokens we don't know as Mm -hmm. things like, let's say Uniswap, for example. But what we do know is like blockchain native assets. That's your BTC, your ETH, your SOL, your NIR, whatever. These things that are selling block space, those are going to be on the CFTC. Those are commodities, which is huge. I think there's a lot of lawsuits right now, actually, the SEC with Coinbase and Kraken, et cetera, that have Solana, for example, or Polygon as as a security. And I guess that's going to probably go away. I don't Mm -hmm. know how that works in terms of the lawsuits, but this clears up a lot. Now, to be clear, this isn't like a done deal yet. The vote is done. But what happens here is... We still need to make the legislation or make the rules, right? But we have some guidance on them, but then they need to go and actually like fill everything out. And so like, it's not a perfect setup yet, but this is the right step in the direction. And so basically this week though, we've just, everything, I think we put out a thing in um, a, a newsletter in Milk Road on Monday saying like the top five things to look for. And it was, you know, ETH ETF, it was the Fit 21 bill, it was the SAB, whatever that was called. And we've just nailed them all. Somehow we're mm-hmm. just checking them off. I don't know what's happening, but everything seems to be going our way this week. And this is just, this is massive momentum for the crypto space. Yeah, I think this is probably the biggest week ever for crypto regulation in the US. Put this date on your calendar. Yeah. History books will be talking about this. And to cap it all off, the Biden administration actually put out a statement 
that said that they're going to work with Congress to create a balanced regulatory framework for digital assets. So even the Biden administration is changing their tune. And they're not the only ones that were excited about this. We had Brian Armstrong get in on the party. He was celebrating as well pointing out that 71 Democrats voted for FIT21. He thought that it would be somewhere in the range of 20 to 40, but seeing 71 cross really shows how much these congressmen think, congressmen and congresswomen think that crypto is an important uh, piece of their voting and they're willing to do what they need to do for their constituents and vote in favor of this. So big step forward. And then we also had... Mike Dudas, founder of The Block, say, this is great, floodgates are open, Americans love crypto, the politicians understand that their constituents love crypto, day one. This really is day one for the US. It's such a big step, and I don't know that people realize there's so many founders that have had to move out of the US in order to run a company in this space, which is just unheard of and unbelievable. A lot of VCs that are giving capital, they're actually looking like, hey, are you prepared to move out of the US or do you not live in the US? They want to invest in non-US companies. That It's not changed fully yet, but it's starting to change. And obviously, the US is very important in terms of innovation. They've got Silicon Valley. They've basically built the internet uh, in terms of everything we use on the internet. And it's a lot of people and a lot of resources that we want fighting for crypto and pushing the crypto industry forward. And there was a little bit there where we were like, shit, are we going to have to leave the US behind and do this stuff on our own? We're going to have to move all over to Europe or wherever, El Salvador. And it looks like, no, the US is going to be a part of this. Now, we'll see where things go, but things are looking really good right now. So this is a big day. I'm really excited. Yeah, I think when we step back and we look at this is the turning point where obviously we're going to finally get the clarity that we need, that we've all been demanding for so long. As you said, Kai, that clarity is going to lead more builders to be able to build the products that need to be built in order to take crypto to the mainstream. But also, this is going to allow more big players to enter the game. There's a lot yeah. of big enterprises that are sitting on the sidelines right now, right? Apple, Google, Amazon, Netflix, all these large players they're scared. They don't want to. It's not worth it for them to risk coming into crypto and blockchain when there's no clear regulation. Well, what happens once there is clear regulation? They join the party. And what happens once they join the party? You guaranteed the whole world retail follows suit because everyone's like, oh, you guys trust that? Well, I trust that as well. And it's also been interesting to see the way the political tides have just shifted so fast. Kai, we talked about, remember, uh, I don't remember if it was the last week or two weeks, time is so so funny in crypto, when Trump held that rally and he yeah. had, who did he have? He had Ryan Selkis and one of the founders of Polygon on stage with him talking about crypto. And obviously Trump was shilling his NFTs at the same time, which is hilarious. But that seemed to be maybe, like, do you think that-, that was- I- I think that might have been the catalyst. Like uh, Biden was seeing, so. we're going into an election year. Biden saw that Trump is, you know, really going hard on crypto. And Biden's sitting there being like, am I going to lose this election because I didn't support crypto? Like, no, like that's a stupid thing to do. And so he switched his tune and here we are. Wild times, wild year. But I mean, hey, if you wanted the perfect setup for this bull cycle, people are saying, are we at the top? Is this cycle over? Guys. We've got macro still is just getting cleaned up. Inflation's coming down. Interest rates still waiting. They're still high. So when those come down, you bet that we're moving into risk environment. And now not only are we going to move into risk environment from macro side of things, we've basically got the approval to do it from the US. So you talk about what's going to be that catalyst that drives this next stage of the bull market. Well, uh, it's here, guys. Um, So pack your bags, get ready. It's going to be a big, big, let's say 12 to 18 months. Giddy up, baby. Crypto will go up more than 100x in both users and value over the next decade. If you're listening to this right now, you're extremely early and have an incredible opportunity to capitalize. At Milk Road, our mission is to make you smarter about crypto. That's why we're doing today's podcast and why we send you a daily newsletter for free. But if you're ready to level up as an investor, then let me tell you about Milk Road Pro. We crafted this resource for investors who are already smart enough about crypto and are looking for more actionable insights on how to invest successfully in one of the fastest growing industries on earth. Every week, we break down the latest trends, dive into tokenomics of popular and up and coming tokens, and get into the nitty gritty of market analysis, all to help you invest smarter. Plus, we have a private Discord community for pro members. It's like your backstage pass to the Milk Road crew 
exclusive insights, hot tips, and live AMAs with our team. Now, if you're looking to level up as an investor, then click the link in the show notes below and sign up to Pro Today. Don't let this bull market opportunity slip through your fingers. All right, next up, we are going to talk about an exciting story out of Jupiter this week. That is the giant unified market initiative, also called the GUM initiative. Jupiter, I run a marketing agency. If you want to talk, I'll help you out with your branding here. Uh, But that aside, this is super exciting news out of Jupiter. Let me tell you what this is. So this is a alliance, basically, that aims to bring all assets onto Solana. So I'm talking meme coins. I'm talking real world assets. I'm talking stocks, commodities. And this GUM alliance includes many top partners from within the Solana ecosystem who are already aiming to achieve all these things independently. And Jupiter has always had this mission of becoming the everything exchange, basically being one single marketplace that is accessible to everybody in the whole world where you can do anything from purchase U.S. stocks such as Apple or coin, you can buy real estate, you can buy U.S. treasury, which could yield you a 5% yield, Uh, you could provide liquidity to different markets, all these things all in one place. And that's what the GUM Alliance aims to do. And I think a lot of people miss this week, Kai, but to me, this was super exciting news because this is aiming at achieving really what we've all been talking about from the beginning of not just bringing the monetary system on chain, but bringing all real world assets on chain as well. And here we are seeing it happen. Well, not happen. This is them saying they're going to look to achieve this in the future, but a first step in that direction from Jupiter and uh, very bullish on them and Solana right now. Yeah, I mean, Jupiter's a a beast of a project, what they're doing. Their, Their protocol is amazing. And so all the kudos to Jupiter. Gum is a weird name for whatever this thing is. I don't really understand, but I get what they're trying to do. Of course, I think that's super cool. I think it's going to happen. Hopefully it happens on Jupiter, but we'll see. We'll see what happens, how good this alliance actually does. I have no idea. Yeah, I think that it makes me think about uh, almost what X has been trying to achieve and what Elon has been talking about, which is like the everything app, right? And Jupiter is trying to be that same thing, but for all assets And right now, when you think about it, if you want to buy all these different types of assets, you have to do it in such a fragmented way. Yeah. Think about the world where everything you buy is all and can all be swapped for each other, whether it's stocks, crypto, real estate, commodities, it's just all in one platform, permissionless. And you just like you could swap your stock for your real estate and your real estate for your fiat. And it's just, there's no fees. It's permission. It's a wild world. Whenever we get there, I think it's a long ways away, but Mm -hmm. it is going to be really, really cool. And the world is going to change a lot whenever that happens. Like liquidity is going to be moving at the speed of light. And that's really the purpose of what Solana is trying to do. Super cool. And and opening it up globally, that it's cross border now, and then enabling anyone to participate without KYC, when we talk about how much of the world is unbanked because they can't access it just simply because their government doesn't have the proper infrastructure to allow them to enter the financial system the way the rest of us can. Yeah, I just, I think initiatives like this, they are what we are all here for from the beginning. So yeah, shout out to Jupiter, shout out to the team, big news and uh, excited to see how this goes. Uh, I'm certainly going to be Uh, following along closely and we'll keep you guys up to date let's stick with the rwa theme and i want to go over to coinbase here kai something that i think some people missed this week was coinbase announced that they are launching retail sized oil and gold futures on june 3rd further progress towards commodities coming on chain and rwas being available to everyone Yes, basically what we're talking about, right? Like Coinbase, you can already buy crypto. You can put your feet on there kind of like a bank. And now they're going to allow, I mean, it's just futures. So it's not really what we're saying, but they're having other things that you can trade on their platform. So Coinbase looking to be more than just crypto, which makes sense. Everything is merging into one. TradFi, crypto, it's all kind of merging together. It's like we don't have internet companies anymore. We just have companies. It's merged, right? And the same thing's happening with crypto. Coinbase though, absolute beast right now. And they are... They're way more than just a crypto exchange. I think a lot of people sleeping on that. They are becoming a bank and they are becoming a NASDAQ-like exchange. Like They are becoming 
just the place where you're going to put your money to work and you're going to swap and trade everything similar to Jupiter. The difference is it's a centralized exchange and Jupiter is a decentralized exchange. So how's that going to work? How's that going to play out? I think there's room for both. We're not going to go fully decentralized exchanges all the time, like now or even in the next years to, I don't know how long it's going to take to get fully on DEXs and Coinbase is going to cannibalize their own company, I think with base and probably putting everything they have on chain, but it's going to take a long, 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 long time for that to happen. Okay, let's jump to the next story, which you might have missed earlier this week. This actually happened last week. But if you're subscribed to the Milk Road newsletter, you didn't miss this. So if you're not subscribed to the new Milk Road newsletter, you're going to want to subscribe because these are the types of stories that you just don't want to miss. And I'm talking about Pump.Fun and what happened with their hack this week. Let me bring you up to speed on what happened here, Kai, so that you're in the know and everyone else listening as well. Okay, so first of all, Pumped Up Fund last Thursday was hacked for about $2 million. Now, this hack revolves around a former, it was done by a former employee whose name is Stack. That's his name on Twitter. Now, this former employee recently lost his mom and he actually got kicked off the pump.fund team. So there's a little bit of uh, clearly, you know, he's struggling with some mental health issues because he lost his mom. Sorry that you lost your mom, my man. But also he got kicked off the team. So he's probably got a little bit of a vengeance and wants some revenge against the pump.fund team. So what does he do? Uh, he goes and he steals about $2 million from a hack that he completes. And then he puts up this tweet. Uh, and this tweet, as you can see here on screen, Kai, got about 2 million views. And here's what he says. He says, and now magic. Everybody cool. This is a robbery. What it do, <laughs> stack attack? I'm about to change the course of history and then rot in jail. Am I sane? Nah. Am I well? Very much not. Do I want for anything? My mom raised from the dead. And barring that, life without parole, sticking this here now. If Stack winds up dead, it was not a suicide. I will tell you this. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. So this guy goes public, admits that he stole the $2 million, and talks about all this online. He's clearly really struggling. I really feel for this guy. He's having a real mental crisis here. And I'm not trying to bring this up to make fun of anybody who's lost a parent. Horrible situation to be in. But he's also really taking this to a bit further. He then goes on to basically accuse his former bosses at Pumped Up Fun of not being sympathetic to him losing his mom, which is why he was then let go from the pumped up fund team. He then proceeded to airdrop soul tokens to tons of people around the crypto ecosystem, basically saying that he was kind of acting like the Robin Hood of crypto. And then he, when asked about the hack, he starts to talk about how the founders withdrew $2 million from the treasury the previous day. So the day before he did the hack, sealing $2 million, these numbers are clearly not a coincidence, the founders withdrew $2 million, And so he suggests that they should have to pay for the hack themselves. He then demands that the founders pay $100,000 out to every non-founder of Pumped Up Fund who had ever contributed. And then he threatens to burn all the funds if his demands aren't met. You just, you can't make this stuff up. And then where does this all end? On Saturday, Stack was arrested by British law enforcement and he's now in custody. And you want to know why he was arrested? Because he was on Instagram posting that he was in a strip club in London, which obviously the cops saw his Instagram and then were able to find him. Uh, a wild tournament. You know what? <laughs> what worries me the most is just seeing everything that this guy's written who are these people that are working at some of these protocols that we're trusting and putting our money into? Uh, this is nothing to say against the pumped up fund team. I have no idea who works there. I've never met anyone from that team, but this is not who I want to be building the protocols uh, that mm -hmm. I'm going to be trusting and putting my money into a wild situation. But this is the shit that happens in crypto. It's just, it's so crazy to me that the number of hackers that seem to <laughs> complete a hack and then go on crypt and on then, crypto twitter and then talk about it openly it's like, just unbelievable like you you realize that what you did 
is illegal and you could be arrested, don't you? What are you <laughs> thinking? It reminds me of, a, I got to make a Canadian hockey reference here, Kai. It's as if these people think that they're in a hockey game, where in a hockey game, you can punch somebody in the face and you are clear from legal action for any yeah. of the damage that you caused that person. So it's as if these guys think they're in a hockey game, but you're not. This is not a game. This is real life, everybody. Come on. What are you thinking? <laughs> nice Canadian reference there. <laughs> okay, let's go to in case you missed it. There was in case you missed it, there was a, a lot. So many this week. this week. Holy Jesus. I think okay. everyone missed everything. I mean, every story you said, you literally start off with I think most people missed this one. It's kind of funny because literally <laughs> there wasn't much to pay attention to other than the ETTF. <laughs> okay, first up, in case you missed it, CryptoPunks dropped a new collection called Super Punk World. Kai. What was your reaction? When oh, you saw as you can collection? see, my face is, or my hand is currently covering my eyes right now. It's terrible. If you guys have seen this art, it is so bad. I don't even know. I can't even explain it. Honestly, it looks just terrible. If you guys watch on YouTube or if you're listening on Spotify, just open up your app. We have it on the screen right now. I don't know what this is. These guys should be thankful that the ETF, ETF thing was going on this week because this didn't get as much coverage as it should. I'll let you finish the story. It's just so bad. They got a whole bunch of flack for this. They look, they engaged an artist who was aiming at creating a new collection that celebrated diversity and was in line with the woke movement. And instead it landed completely flat and really had a lot of people thinking like, what is Yuga Labs doing? And is it a shame that Yuga Labs owns CryptoPunks, which really is one of the most important NFT collections in our space? And are they going to ruin it? I don't know. I just, this is very, it just scares me to see what Yuga Labs is up I to. I saw a lot, of, a lot of punks holders on Twitter saying, that's it for me. This is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The price is down real bad. It is down to, it's a 35 ETH, which is still pretty, pretty wild. It's almost 100K. But maybe there's 100K. I can't do the math right now. But anyway, it's actually this $127,000 is the floor. <laughs> Which is still but super high. But, but when you consider that it was pretty much, it had not really dropped below 50. Maybe it was like 45 ETH. But there was a- It reached was 125 ETH in October Jeez. of 2021. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. If you, I mean, if you the thing already... with punks is it's meant to just be- there is no art. community around. It's not meant to, yeah, it's just art. It's just was the one of the first, well, was the first PFP to ever really come across. And that's what makes it cool. You don't do anything else with it. That's just, that's what everyone wanted. It was like, just don't touch this thing. Anyway. All right, next, next up. In case you missed it, Craig Wright is not Sasoshi Nakamoto. No surprise here. Craig Wright was found guilty of mass forgery of documents for years as he attempted to convince the world that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. He's not. We still don't know who Satoshi is. And you know what? Honestly, I hope it stays that way. Yeah, agreed. I think it will. For those of you that are new in this space, have no idea who Craig Wright is. He's just this guy that has been in crypto for a while. And he decided one day to say that he is the guy that started Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto. And I guess through court, they've decided it's not him. Everyone in the industry decided it was not him a long time ago. So like, this doesn't really matter, but <laughs> <laughs> screw that guy. Okay, next up, in case you missed it, Farcaster raised $150 million backed by Paradigm this week. An absolutely massive raise. This is at a $1 billion valuation, Kai. And wow, is it really? A, I was just going to ask a that. Great comparison here is, do you remember who else had a $1 billion valuation early on in their history? sold yeah. to Facebook for a billion dollars. And let's look at the numbers here. When Instagram sold to Facebook, that was in 2012, Instagram had 30 million monthly active users. How many users do you think Farcaster <laughs> has? And I'm not trying to rip on Farcaster. I like Farcaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just be clear. Well, we're talking about 100,000 maybe? Monthly 50, active? No, less than 50,000 oh daily, daily active users. So like Monthly okay. versus daily, but still they're not even in the same ballpark. So two takes here, either a lot has changed since 2012, which yeah, okay, sure it has. A lot has changed and valuations have gone up a lot for tech. And But also I would say the real take here is that 
there's much bigger potential for open networks and protocols versus an ads based business like Instagram. Yeah, I think it's just the dollars worth a lot less. <laughs> to be honest, like a billion dollar valuation, which used to be the unicorn is no longer a unicorn thing anymore. So that's my take. <laughs> Fine, just slam my take. Why don't you? Okay, <laughs> next up, Uniswap responded to their SEC Wells notice this week with one of the best lines I've seen in a while. They said, the SEC is not the world internet police. Amen to that. See ya. Bye. Next up, the Grayscale CEO stepped down this week. A surprise nobody saw this coming. Really a surprise considering Grayscale's success. And they are one of the most important crypto institutions in the world. And you know what's really interesting is who's going to replace him is the an executive from Goldman Sachs, Peter Mintzberg, who is a TradFi guy. So we got a crypto institution that is bringing in a new CEO from the TradFi world. Very interesting to see. We talked about last week how Vanguard CEO stepped down and they're replacing him with a crypto guy. So yeah. going both directions. Here. This one I could, as much as they are the most important and, and one of the biggest without a doubt, they also just created the record for the longest day straight of outflows for an ETF by a long shot and the most amount as well, like billions of dollars of outflows, which has just never happened in an ETF before. And it happened because there's a lot to it. This was a weird one with the court case, et cetera, et cetera. But they did come in with this like 1.5% fee or two, whatever it is, versus every other ETF is like minuscule, it's 0.15 or whatever. So it was obvious these outflows would happen. It was a weird move by them, but obviously they made a ton of money from it. So I wonder, they lost a lot of customers from that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, was it his decision? Was it not his decision? I have no idea. Or was it just everyone's decision and he's just got to be the guy that takes the reins for it and mm -hmm. away you go. Don't know, but hopefully this TradFi guy is cool. He's not a boomer. Okay, next up, in case you missed it, the Venezuela government has seized the Bitcoin mining that is facilities that are currently set up in Venezuela and cracking down, basically saying Bitcoin mining is no longer a thing in our country, which there was a lot of Bitcoin mining happening in Venezuela. You know why? Because the cost of energy in Venezuela is quite low. But what all these Bitcoin miners clearly didn't anticipate is it's also a government that is not a predictable government and can do things like this in an instant. There's a video that if you want to, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the, I don't know if this is the president of Venezuela or some minister, I'm sure, standing in front of a bunch of army officials, like holding guns, like AK 47s. And then they're surrounded by just like server machines. Like, <laughs> it's unfortunate because the Venezuelan, I think it's peso or whatever it is, inflating away like crazy. So, like, Bitcoin is a big solution there. They obviously have a huge financial problem, but the problem is they also have a energy problem in Venezuela. And so obviously Bitcoin miners use a lot of energy. So that's the real reason they're doing this. I don't know if it's because they care about the financial side, um, although I'm pretty sure they care about that too. But it kind of sucks. There's like just a lot of problems going on in Venezuela. And the one solution is, you know, if we can mine some Bitcoin, get Bitcoin in the hands of the citizens, that would be pretty helpful. But they're not down with that. Unfortunate to see for sure. Okay. Next up, in case you missed it, there was a exciting pilot program that happened this week between the finished this week between Edward Jones, Franklin Templeton, JP Morgan, and US Bank, and, and about six other banks, some of the largest banks in the world, partnered with Chainlink to test out using blockchain to store data that the DTCC uses in order to settle most of the financial transactions that happen in the US. For those who don't know, the DTC, DTCC is responsible for settling two, about $2.5 quadrillion in transactions every year. And they do this mainly by needing to share various documents between asset managers. So they, the idea here is that rather than share these documents between asset managers in these current ledgers that they use in these old archaic ways. The idea is to store this relevant data in smart contracts on chain using Link, Chainlink's token as the central source between it all. Look, very exciting to see these types of, this news kind of really, I don't think anyone saw this news, but 
very exciting to see how much the TradFi world and these banks are embracing blockchain. They're doing it slowly. They're doing pilot tests, but this had a lot of positive results and a lot of the banks saying, yeah, there's some great use cases here for blockchain. We'll take it. We'll take it. Okay, let's go to agree or disagree. Kai, one of our favorite segments of the week. First up here, we have from Tang Yan. He says, unlike previous cycles, this is the market where you don't want to be portfolio heavy in alts if you can help it. The majors, BTC, ETH, Sol, are outperforming significantly on a risk-adjusted basis. It's easy to see why the trend will continue institutional bid. I don't think that I agree with this. Uh, I think alts are going to do just, they're going to go absolutely nuts. But the thing that everyone is missing, as we talk about almost on every single roll-up episode, is these people are confusing how the cycles work. We've always said it goes Bitcoin, then it goes ETH, then it goes alts. And for some reason, people think that we just need to obliterate through that. And it happens in like a couple of days and Bitcoin did really well. So all of a sudden it's Ethan and it's all. It's like, no, guys, we had our Bitcoin. We're still only about halfway through the cycle. ETH is coming. It was already happening this week. And, and same with Soul along with it. And Soul has been going along and has actually done really well, which is also funny because Soul wasn't a major at the beginning of the cycle. True, it was an alt. True. And now it's a major yeah. because it did so well. So obviously he's missing something there. And then I think after ETH has its moment for the next little bit here, I think alts are going to do really well. Although you're already going to see the ETH tokens as well are just absolutely skyrocketing too. So I think, I, I, I don't know, I disagree. I think you just need to give it time. Bitcoin, then ETH, then alts. We're not at that part of the cycle yet where everything just goes ballistic. We're still working our way through there. Rates are still high. Macro mm -hmm. is still not cleared up. We are not in that 2021 era that we had last cycle. That's coming. And in that moment is when you damn well better be holding some alts because those things are going to go absolutely ballistic. But yes, as I've been saying, hold Bitcoin, hold ETH, hold Sol, because these are important at this point in the cycle. It's so easy to think that we skipped ETH and alts because meme coins have also ripped so early. And yeah. so I think there's a lot of people that are just buying this narrative that like we're skipping ETH and alts in this cycle, which yeah. as you said, makes no sense. Be patient, everybody. Be patient. Yeah. It's coming. Okay, next up from Daniel Got Hits. He says, the difference between this cycle and previous cycles is last cycles on a day like today, and let me be clear, on the day like today is Monday that he's referring to uh, when the speculation around the ETH ETF changed from 25% to 75%. On a day like today, FOMO running hot, maybe a couple people, couple rich people aped in a few million bucks. Today, Wall Street is clicking buttons and buying hundreds of millions of crypto in seconds, not the same. There were institutions buying a lot of crypto last cycle too. Obviously, it's at a different level with the ETFs now. I sort of agree. The behind the scenes is, is definitely different, but it's all kind of the same. Whether it's institution or person, they all have FOMO. They're all buying with speculation. And so money's moving around. But yes, there's bigger money moving around, which is what allows Bitcoin and Ethereum to still move at trillions to hundreds of billions of dollars of, of, of market caps. You need that bigger money to move these bigger assets. Yeah, I agree. I don't agree, disagree. I don't know. I don't know if you yeah. fully agreed with that one, Kai. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, next up, Edgy, the DeFi Edge says, all you had to do was chill and not fuck up the past two weeks. Starting to think being able to sit still is an edge. Oh man, this is like the biggest edge. If you can, and this is what no one has in today's <laughs> world, but if you have some patience and you can buy an asset and then not touch it for two, three years, even longer in crypto, if you can hold it for five, 10 years, you've done better than basically anyone who's tried to trade this stuff. So like anyone who bought Bitcoin in 2010 did better than anyone who tried to trade around these cycles because these cycles are nuts. And moving in and out of all these ridiculous assets are nuts. If you just hold Bitcoin since the beginning or hold ETH since the beginning or hold Solana since the beginning, like you would have done better than most investors in any industry ever. And so it's just buy and hold, build some conviction and then don't do anything. The more you do, the more you fuck up. That's that I think this is, I agree more than I probably ever agreed on anything, Jay. <laughs> so, so long as show. that, so, so long as that asset actually has a it's use a good case. Asset. Is a yeah, good asset. Yeah. Has a good can, team. As you're saying that, I'm thinking about NFTs, which you know a lot of people held, and those haven't done so well. But they right. weren't. They weren't. They still should. They are still growing businesses that are trying to figure it out. Maybe they come back. A few of them will. Most of them will not. Right. Meme coins also going to see big rise. Going to see big fall because they're not 
legitimate businesses. Network are, effects. Just, they, exactly. Okay, next up, QW says, there's no doubt in my mind now that moving money across the globe via stable coins is the least sexy, yet by far the biggest and most real use case of crypto. Yeah, it's basically whenever people ask me, like, what is the point in crypto? I always go to stable coins now. It to mm -hmm. me is the most obvious use case. It is the thing that basically solves a problem for everyone in the world. Now, not every American, especially Americans that don't leave the US, it doesn't solve a problem for them because they have Venmo. But if you're an American that goes anywhere else in the world, or you're anyone else in the world, basically, or you're anyone in the world that travels to anywhere else in the world, stable coins is the best. There's mm -hmm. billions of people that want access to dollars that can't get it. There is ridiculous fees and remittances to send money from one country to like to your family and other countries. Take, like, some of these companies take like 30, 40%. Can you believe that? Uh, it's crazy. absolutely nuts. And then just like the fees and not even just fees, but the time it takes right. to send money from one country to another is absolutely nuts. The thing I always explain is I can pack my suitcase with $9,500 in US dollars and take it to Europe faster than I can just send it digitally which is just <laughs> take it on a plane faster than I can send it digitally, which is nuts in 2024. And so stable coins is the solution to all this. And it already exists. It already works. We're already there. And so it's so, so, so obvious. And so it's the thing I'm most bullish on by far. You, you could take more than $9,500. You just wouldn't be able to do it legally. You would be that, doing exactly. it Well, illegally. that's the thing. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why, why, that that's why you picked that number. <laughs> 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 okay, last one. Steve's DeFi says, born too late to explore the earth, born too early to explore the galaxy, born just in time to watch crypto change the world. I love that. That's nice. Although, I don't know. I've been exploring the earth for the last five years as a nomad, and I think I love it. So I don't know. I don't think you're too late at all to do that. I think and, he, you know, he, I don't know. He, he, and maybe we're going to explore the, the galaxy. First. He means being like I know, the first I know. to explore. Yeah, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love I this it. one. Oh, this I, is... I just happen to be here to be a part of this crypto revolution. Yeah. That's what excites me the most. So I agree 100%. And we are happy that you're here with us too, Kai. And more importantly, we're happy that every one of you listening in is here with us every week here at Milk Road as we do our best to onboard everybody into crypto in a safe and responsible and simple way. We know it's confusing. We know there's so much happening. It is very difficult to keep it up with all of it. But that's what we're here for at Milk Road is to make sure that you're on top of it every day of the week. So thank you so much for being part of this journey without you. We couldn't do it without you. We're so grateful. Have a great weekend, everybody. And we'll see you next week on the Milk Road Radio. Thank you for listening to Milk Road Radio, the easiest path to get smarter about crypto. If you like this episode, share it and hit subscribe or follow so you don't miss out on the next one. There's also a link in the description to our free five-minute daily newsletter where we simplify crypto for you while making you laugh. And if you're willing to step up your crypto investing game, then we'll leave a link to Milk Road Pro as well, your number one resource to help you invest successfully in crypto. One final note, this podcast is for educational purposes is only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto is risky, so you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and we'll see you in the next one.